Thank you. So all the colleagues before kind of spoke about um, essentially Bell generated natively from literature or generated by a crowd uh, from knowledge. I'm going to focus, whoa, yeah, I'm going to focus slightly differently. This is quite dark in, in real life there. Um, trying new templates for presentations for Clarivate Analytics here. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm going to kind of focus slightly uh, on, a, on a slightly different endeavor, which is where we took existing data uh, that we already had in-house and that's already been um, uh, curated and tested many times, and the benefits of converting that to Bell. Um, uh, and, and first of all, the mechanics of how you'd go about it, and, and again, this maybe complements uh, some of what we heard, and then also the, uh, the benefits. I am also representing here um, our colleagues at Sanofi and, and uh, Manfred Heinrich specifically. He couldn't be here um, today, but uh, definitely everything um, that I am saying is a, a combination of, of work by uh, uh, two teams. Same slide that Natalia just uh, showed, and I certainly won't go through any detail there, except to say that um, this is a, a marketing slide uh, for, for our work. And when we looked at it, we said, well, where does this bell stuff fits into it? And we realized that it was actually, the marketing slide was missing a huge component of what we do, which is the data modeling integration, which is under knowledge management there. So um, actually, I, I had to call up marketing and, and correct them and say that there's this enormous component of what we do having to do with uh, data modeling and integration. Um, just to uh, touch upon the actual data here, I uh, suspect some of you have heard uh, about uh, MetaBase, which is uh, a proprietary um, database that uh, Thomson Reuters and now Clarivate um, has. There is actually a published a public uh, component of that and uh, working with Dexter we have for example taken some of our uh, published data and made it into Bell um, as something that the public could potentially see. Um, this is the metabase uh, behind all of our systems biology projects um, and it has a tremendous amount of uh, mainly hand curated and also semi-automatically uh, curated just to kind of harken back to um, some of what we talked about um, a little bit. It is focused on networks and pathways um, and I am an IT person rather than a scientist so if you have scientific questions about it I think uh, Natalia would be a better person to ask and, and any number of the folks that we have here uh, rather than myself. It is an Oracle database uh, and our clients get the data in Oracle format. They can access it through various user interfaces and APIs. Um, however, it's a huge, huge Oracle database that is practically um, unfit for human consumption uh, if you just look at it. Um, and it requires tremendous amount of training uh, to, to understand. Um, so case study here of what we could do with that data. Um, and it came uh, as, as, a, as a call for us to help integrate Metabase into the Sanofi knowledge environment. Um, of course, Sanofi can try to integrate relational database. Uh, however, it's quite difficult, quite a lot of work, um, and we wanted to improve that step. We also wanted to use that as a platform for developing uh, a workflow for converting our data, um, and specifically Metabase, but uh, our data into uh, Bell. And I, for all the Bell here, I have Bell 1.0, and it's a technical uh, point here, and I think pretty much everyone here knows how, however, if you don't know, uh, Bell, ecosystem, Open Bell ecosystem, consists of Bell language itself, uh, which now exists in two versions, 1.0 and, and now 2.0, recently released. Um, everything I'm talking about that is based on 1.0, uh, partly because it started before 2.0 was released, and partly because uh, right now there is more support uh, for that version, and 2.0 is, is quite new. Uh, in that ecosystem also live um, other things such as uh, software to use it and, and visualize it and so on, and build networks and so on. I will touch very briefly on that later. Um, we also wanted to develop and test the, the Bell data model to see how easy it would be to really create a Bell. There is an RDF component to it. Um, 
again, this is something that I think we haven't mentioned before today, but, but uh, one of the ways that uh, Bell works is it's, it's essentially a triple-based data. There is a subject, a relationship, and an object, and that uh, lends itself quite well into, uh, to, to our DF uh, representation. Some clients we have uh, are heavier on RDF than others, um, but, uh, but there is uh, an ability right now to convert Bell into RDF, um, and that comes built in with the uh, Open Bell platform. So uh, uh, worth mentioning um, here. And then the real key element for Sanofi was, of course, integrating that data with other data. Um, and that is, is really where it comes into its own. So looking a little bit of, of um, uh, these, are, these are slides from my colleagues at Sanofi. Um, so first objective from their perspective was to simplify the integration of, of their contact, uh, content streams. And so Sanofi had made a choice uh, to base a lot of their integration around RDF as a platform. And their linked data store is ba based heavily um, uh, in RDF world. But in order to do that, there needed to be that RDF conversion component, and Bell provides it so easily and so naturally that from their perspective, uh, Bell provided sort of two benefits. One was to kind of pre-standardize the data from various sources before it even becomes RDF, before it goes into that central data store, and Bell... Uh, gently nudges you towards that type of standardization, both through the use of common uh, um, namespaces and through the use of this relatively straightforward model. Um, and then if everything comes in Bell, then RDF conversion is pretty simple. You don't have to spend any of your time worrying about complicated RDF models, which can get quite complex. Um, so so the, the first goal was simplicity. Um, and then, of course, the main goal, the second goal, was integration. And this shows that uh, at the moment, and that is fully functional and they keep adding data every day um, into the Sanofi Link data store. Um, they have a variety of biochemistry, genetics, uh, tons of uh, various public databases and ontologies are in their omics data. Um, and then um, uh, our um, proprietary content, not just from uh, uh, Clarivate, uh, formerly Thomson Reuters, but also from several other uh, proprietary uh, data sources. The scope, from my perspective, um, I, I'm the project lead on all of our Bell efforts within Clarivate. Um, so the, the scope here was to convert as much of Metabase as we could, which includes interactions, proteins, genes, microRNAs, compounds, reactions, groups, complexes, diseases, and all of the associated metadata. Some of the namespace building also had to be done. Bell does come with pre-built namespaces, but of course, when you have a proprietary data source, um, you need to extend them, and, and that actually, again, demonstrates that it's quite easy, really, to extend their namespaces, and there's a, a provision for uh, providing customized namespaces, so for example, complexes and groups, which are unique uh, to uh, meta-based content. Um, build a pipeline to, to automate uh, that, that process and, and creating a content and to, to our customers. We also did want to create Bell data that, of course, could be validated. And so we wanted to, to have a, a, a process there that would validate that data uh, within the framework and, and Cytoscape. Um, and then actually, as a, because uh, Sanofi specifically was interested in the RDF component, we uh, took uh, quite an active role in looking at uh, Bell to RDF conversion, which is again part of the Open Bell platform. Um, and so we, what we did there is um, worked uh, quite a bit with uh, uh, the Bell software to, there were some bugs we found, to, to fix some of the bugs and to uh, improve RDF-facing um, elements such as, for example, making sure that uh, URIs are um, aligned to identifiers.org, which is um, a, a, an important URI uh, source for uh, life sciences data. Um, by now, everybody already knows, uh, so skipping lightly over this. All I will say, again, we've seen slides like that already today, all I will say here is that what what uh, this structure uh, gave to us was the ability to 
create rules for data conversion. So I'll focus less on, on what this means for Belb and more on what it means to, say, software developers. It's very nice for them to have this structured format and then to see how data, uh, rules for data conversion uh, would work. Likewise, just pointing out here that, that all these statements come with annotation and what is cool from our perspective was that there is standard annotation and, and um, kind of expanding on what, what, what Dexter talked about, there's also custom annotation. So any amount of information that say our customers wanted that is not currently modeled uh, in Bell, we could quite easily drop in there th uh, through custom annotation. Um, all of this, uh, again, I think is known to most people here, but just to highlight a few things, um, that there is, again, for uh, software developers, it's easy to see that this, this pretty much summarizes what you need to know, and, and it's very handy, again, for expressing rules, and you will see it in a second, but here we say, okay, abundance, there are some types of abundances, a few types of processes, and a few types of annotation, and that's it, and really that's how you would structure, uh, structure your rules around it, uh, plus uh, a few additional features, um, and I will just note here that um, Bell 2.0 impro improves um, a little bit on the syntax and then on a few um, details, primarily uh, support for, uh, for genomic variations. A um, little bit more summary, that's perfectly fine here. Uh, I will touch upon this. Uh, Open Bell supports uh, 32 standard namespaces and annotations. Now, in this particular uh, case, what they're talking about for um, annotations is things like disease namespaces and so on, as well as uh, namespaces for uh, genes, biological processes, chemi uh, chemicals, and so on. What does it mean that it uh, supports them? It comes with that data. That data is being generated as part of Open Bell distribution, and uh, you can download that, that data, and you can also customize and enhance it uh, through uh, creating your own. Uh, just to touch upon Belltio, in case some are wondering, um, there's a wonderful document on openbell.org uh, website for that, uh, but just, just to, do, do, to uh, point out that there is, there's been a, a few things, and, and the top three are probably sort of most important there, but it, it just uh, improves on some of the details. And actually, when, because we use 1.0, there is some of MetaBase we weren't able to convert because there was no support for some of these additional features at the time. Not a huge, uh, there's a lot of information here. You don't have to worry too much about it, except to, to note that, again, from a software developer's perspective, what we needed then to do is to map the key players in MetaBase universe to the key players in Bell universe. And w what are some of the key players here? We have biological entities, interactions between them, and pathways. We have their drugs, literature references, and a disease and toxicity associations. And you can already see, so literature reference provides a lot of the, um, the supporting information, of course, uh, and then interactions are naturally uh, subject relationship, object type of relationships. So the, the, the conversion um, uh, had quite a bit of uh, logic to it. Um, just to touch up a little bit more um, on details of, of MetaBase. Uh, we have so-called network objects interactions because everything in MetaBase is, is about networks. Um, they had attributes and each of those essentially had to be mapped. Everything is, is uh, in networks. There is about a million, uh, well, and a half uh, of interactions in there. So that's sort of the volumes of data we're talking about, and I'll talk a bit more about that. There's also ontologies, and this is actually part of, of um, MetaBase. We, did not, we do not currently um, convert, but potentially uh, we could. And uh, some of the, most of the pathways data um, at the moment, there is a little bit of pathway, pa pathway data that has been um, converted, but um, the conversion workflow. So there were essentially two major components um, and uh, it's sort of color coded to informatics and IT. In other words, what, what our scientists did versus what our software developers did. So first of all, we wanted to make sure that 
meta-based external references were mapped nicely to the namespaces in um, OpenBell. And I will note one more thing. Um, in terms of integrating with other data sets, now it's, it's perfectly possible to not use this Bell namespaces. You can absolutely use your own. There is support for it. But in terms of integrating with other data sets, it was actually quite advantageous for us to try and keep um, the standard Bell namespaces because, for example, if other vendors serve their public data sources in Bell, it makes it integration practically instantaneous. So we put quite a bit of work into going through all of the namespaces and making sure that everything that's in Metabase uh, maps quite neatly. Um, we added a few things. And then uh, there are complexes and groups which are unique to Metabase and we did generate new ones for those. And then essentially uh, the second component was mapping uh, our network objects and annotations to in their relationships to Bell. Um, so to that end, we uh, mapped mechanisms and object classes to Bell uh, triples. And then uh, what in Metabase are called descriptions, we may mapped those to, uh, to annotation, to, to context. And then, of course, we extracted the data, converted the data, <coughs> created files. We went uh, through the, the, the upper right corner. There is essentially validate, validation of the data. So um, just a bit of detail just to show sort of the, the scope of the work there. So we mapped uh, what we call kind units, which are species specific, to types of Bell abundances. And Bell abundances are things in a Bell language, as it were. And then activities, effects were mapped to relationships, including direct interactions, uh, post translation modifications. Um, and then there is also there's sort of mappings, which are also rules, right? A mapping is a rule, if this, then that. However, there are also more complex uh, rules, which are actually if, then, else, and I will show an example in a bit. And we felt that there are some things that mapped uh, directly and then some things that required a little bit of logic around them. So here's an example of a, a simple mapping. This is a, just simply a screenshots of an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and you know, it, it's a bit busy there, but, but uh, importantly at the very top column, um, we have the actual SQL term because it's a metabase sits in a SQL database. Um, and then there is a has value. So we say, okay, if you're sick, SQL, you, you run your query. If the value is activation, inhibition, and so on, then the bell term is, in this case, a relationship. And then we say, okay, if it's an activation, it, then, then your relationship is an increase relationship. If it's an inhibition, it's a decrease relationship. I'm just looking at the top two lines here, for example. Um, and so on and so forth. And so, so there is, um, oh, I'd say, a few dozen of these uh, relatively simple mappings between essentially relational data uh, and, and Bell information. And then there's slightly more complex mapping rules. Um, probably everybody here knows a whole lot more than I do about transformation by uh, GAP and GAF proteins. But essentially, it's, it's a very simple um, meta language if, then. And so what happens here is typically then um, for simple mappings, a single triple extracted out of metabase, a single um, interaction, what we call it, X, Y, and interaction between them. For the map, simple mappings, it maps to a single Bell statement. And in this cases, um, a, a single triple out of uh, a metabase typically would uh, end up being, in some cases, uh, two or three uh, Bell statements, but they would all have us be in a single unit with the same evidence and and so on. So that's it, it. Bell is very flexible that way. It you could put evidence sort of start and stop as far as you want apart, and everything in between those statements uh, goes together. Similarly, you can go one at a time, and and Bell processes it all correctly and and is able to. Um, to reconcile um, statements with same evidence and similar statements wherever they are in the text. So that helps us a lot as well. There does not need to be any structure to the document. You just kind of throw that stuff in there in any order you like, provided that the evidence is properly attached. 
you are good and it and the identifiers all match um, then uh, the networks can be effectively created so uh, this is uh, what we used for identifiers. And again, this is sort of based on the namespaces that um, uh, OpenBell comes with. Um, and then there are some unique to our metabase groups for human, mouse, and rat complexes. And then um, in metabase, not all of our compounds uh, have the CABI ID. Um, now, compounds in general are a little bit iffy uh, in Bell uh, at the moment. So what we had to do is to come up with a sort of a workaround. We generate as much Bell information as we need, but because of the identifier problem with Metabase and in general with compounds, sometimes um, not, not all compounds have the same identifiers and you can map them one to one. What we did instead is uh, provide an accompanying file with um, structures and then you can always resolve um, all of the uh, all of the compounds, and I will show an example of that. Uh, in terms of experimental context, what we currently provide is the Metabase uh, link ID. That could be useful for, for example, because this data already exists on client sites. So if they want to backtrack uh, to previous uh, experiments or, or presentations and so on, they can say, okay, you know, this information uh, uh, comes right back. Uh, citation evidence uh, were available. Um, species, tissue, and cell line, uh, experimental method, and uh, trust level. Now, trust level in this case is our metabase trust level, uh, which comes with uh, with the data. I will note something that um, might be familiar to uh, to some of the folks that have seen a meta uh, base data in in Bell. Um, what is, uh, what, what is specific to metabase data is that we provide as much evidence as we have. However, uh, part of, of metabase is also using things like um, orthology to, you know, if you found something, let's say, in, in a mouse, you can ortholo orthologize it uh, to rat and so on and so forth. However, some clients want more evidence and some clients want less. And again, what's cool about Bell is, well, we solved that quite simply. We just put everything that has both citation and evidence into one file, Bell file, everything that has, let's say, only a PubMed citation but no specific evidence line into another file, and orth orth orthology relationships into a separate file. Clients who want to combine all three can do so quite easily, uh, just load them all together. Clients who want to select some, you know, the highest trust ones can only take the ones that uh, have um, uh, actual say, uh, evidence line, and so on and so forth. So quite a bit of flexibility there. Okay, just to talk a little bit about uh, technology specifically, we used, as I mentioned, Bell uh, Language Version 1 and Bell Framework Version 2. And there's some confusion about that, but there doesn't need to be. As I said, OpenBell has both the language and the software, so the software was version 2, and that's the stable uh, version of uh, Bell Framework right now. And uh, um, what we used is we build a, a custom uh, software suite. It was primarily implemented with just simple stuff, groovy um, Java libraries, and then um, OpenBell Framework actually provides some Java APIs. So for um, for creating Java objects and so on, we, we used some of that. Uh, what did we end up with? Uh, we had about a million uh, point three. Um, interactions that are not involving diseases, and then about another 4,000 uh, disease-involving interactions. That resulted in almost 4 million Bell statements. So that kind of, again, goes back to show you that not every interaction is one-to-one. -one. It takes about five and a half hours to, to convert. Um, it can be quite easily parallelized. Uh, which is quite excellent because, again, there needs to be no structure whatsoever. So all the interactions that we pull out can be broken up into as many parallel processes as we want and then put back together into networks at a later date. Um, tiny bit of, of techno talk again. Um, uh, we... Um, Let's see, any, anything particularly important here? Uh, we use the Jenkins to schedule this. You know, this is kind of goes back to that whole pipeline. It's almost fully, well, actually, basically fully automated. I'm just running one now, and I send a note to my guys, and then just go into Jenkins, push a button, and everything just starts converting, and uh, everything is automated with, with uh, tests and, and, and everything uh, like that. 
and it generates Bell files plus additional information such as compounds. Uh, and then it can go into through the Bell framework API into things like Cytoscape, Bell to RDF. Part of the pipeline is to convert it, if needs be, into RDF files. Um, we also generate quite extensive log files and statistics, which is actually kind of fun to see because, for example, it helps us diagnose gaps in our own data. We look at something and say, oh, well, this interaction conversion failed. Why? And it'll say something like, oh, well, you know what? They didn't have enough public identifiers or something like that. So, so it helps you um, QC the, the underlying data, which is uh, quite nice. Uh, and then what do we distribute uh, to, to, to clients? Uh, files in Bell format, which contains the actual interaction data. Uh, namespace and equivalence files. Uh, those are, you know, what are equivalences? Those are essentially mappings between things like SwissProt and Entree Gene. So, um, and we distribute both, um, well, but what we distribute is our additions to the standard uh, Bell distribution complex and group membership files, uh, scaffolding and ortology information uh, where needed. Again, those are all in Bell format. Um, and then we just have a very simple uh, tab delimited file of inchy structures that basically looks like that. But what it does is it helps um, uh, uniquely identify all of the compounds where, uh, where needed. There is some data left out. Uh, some of it was by design. Some of it was due to Bell limitations at the time. There are still some Bell limitations. Some of them have been fixed. Um, we've left uh, toxicity information uh, for compounds out for the moment. Pretty much all of the functional ontologies are out in biological assay data by and large. Uh, and then there were some mechanism types that were not compatible with Bell Wino. Um, uh, given the list. Overall, I would say we are looking at something close to about, I think, 90% or more of the data that really converted quite easily, uh, which I think is, is really great. I mean, it shows both that Bell has already quite enough uh, ex ex expressive power um, and that also that if you, you know, think of your data in a certain way, then all of these different formats uh, come together quite nicely. Um, we do test our data, uh, quality tests. So just to, this is more just to highlight to folks what is out there in that sort of Bell toolkit. So there is um, basic syntax checks, which are quite useful. Uh, and that's something if you're a beginner in Bell, uh, that, that uh, toolkit is, is very, very good. Now, uh, syntax simply just says, well, is this correct Bell? The CAM graph, um, is essentially an attempt to take all of those individual Bell statements and put them into a graph and, and join them together. And so what we, for example, do is in, in some cases um, for, our pub, uh, for the data, for example, we, we have looked at that was published, we went forwards and backwards. We took a network that was a network a pathway in Metabase, converted it to Bell, then loaded it back as a cam graph to see how much of the actual graph structure was preserved. And we were able to do quite well. Um, so, so that kind of, again, showed us that we were on the right path. Um, and you can, there, there's various tools. So it loads uh, a, ca a cam graph into any number of databases. There is actually an Oracle backend as well, but this being open source, Oracle is, is sort of um, more sporadically supported there. Um, you can get statistics on your graph, and you can view them um, in, in Cytoscape, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So, um, so now we come to RDF conversion. So at the moment, RDF conversion works through, uh, through these Ruby libraries um, and, and gems, and there is a Bell to RDF function that will convert to, to Turtle. Um, there is um, a script even that converts um, um, equivalence files into turtle files as well, because equivalences are essentially RDF-like relationship. You know, this entree gene ID is like uh, that uh, SwissProt ID and so on. 
In the process of playing with this, we found and fixed several bugs. And what we did is with Sanofi's uh, uh, blessing and encouragement, put them back into open source. So those are, are back and, and, and have been uh, fixed in open source as well. And then an important uh, last bullet there is that, again, we've added alignment to identifiers.org because part of the problem, you can generate RDF your eyes in any way as long as they're unique. I mean, it could be any random string. You could put your own name in there as long as it's unique and is in a proper format. But of course, it's not very useful for joining data sets. Something might be unique, it may be too unique. So what you want is to be meaningfully unique. Um, so identifiers.org is a URI registry that has a lot of the life science, not all, but a lot of the life, life science um, um, the data set or ontologies and, and data sets are, are aligned to it. And so what now happens is where available, uh, RDF conversion will generate identifiers.org, which again makes future integration uh, considerably more uh, seamless. So next big step for us there, of course, is to look at Bell, uh, Bell 2.0. Um, Bell 2.0, the language is complete. Uh, so in that regard, we could certainly go ahead and immediately um, change our conversion. Um, in terms of using the supporting Bell platform, there is a second version of um, Bell framework that's called, now called the Bell platform. Um, and that is in various state of, states of doneness. Some of it works, some of it uh, does not work. Um, there's, there's still some work to be done. There is, again, I'll note to those who might be interested, there is a way to right now simply convert the syntax of Bell 1.0 into 2.0. There is a, a script that will do that. But keep in mind, right, that for any information that was not representable in 1.0 and is therefore not in 1.0 files, you cannot add that information out of thin air when running. So, so you'll, you'll get a slightly changed syntax, but of course you will not get any more power, uh, any, any more data represented unless you add that uh, later. Now, this is something to, um, I've already, I think, mentioned quite a few lessons that we, we learned, uh, but this is kind of going back to also feedback from, from our colleagues at Sanofi. Um, so because they are so heavily focused, Sanofi is so heavily focused on data integration, uh, they feel that there is a need for very strong governance to, to make sure that um, things don't compete and they complement each other. Now, in some sense, this kind of um, harkens back to what Dexter is saying, and, and Dexter is in fact advocating for quite a uh, an ecosystem of various parsers utilities and so on but but i think there is a there is a middle ground there i mean there there is the key word here is sort of competing or or uh, contradictory um and as long as i think we we all stick to standards and, and documentation they could live all quite well uh, together um, Bell platform development, again, we all hear, we, we've talked about this before, uh, we do need to find robust, uh, robust ways to support uh, this open source um, system because it's, it's, there, there is a um, need for somebody to maintain things like namespaces, which are the data resources, corpora, any sort of data that people want to share, there needs to be infrastructure to support that, as well as future developments and, and enhancements. Um, Ruby got mixed reviews uh, from people. They, they, uh, the original Bell framework was not uh, based on Ruby. It was uh, Java-based, or still is. The original Bell framework is still there, and it is Java-based. Um, I think uh, the folks at, at Sylventa formerly used Ruby because of some of the... Uh, it, it's a very nice uh, language for, um, uh, for representing objects and, and so on, but you do need to be an expert in it. So, so something to, to keep in mind that if you do want to kind of roll up your sleeves and dig deeply into the guts of the platform, we certainly had to um, uh, learn quite a bit about uh, Ruby. Uh, documentation uh, needs to be updated. This is due to the fact that now we are transitioning both to the next version of the language and the next version of the software. Now the language documentation has been updated and is uh, perfectly fine, I think. But the software documentation is uh, similarly in transition. There is some documents that are quite fine. There are some where changes on, in, in vocabulary have made, they're not exactly incorrect, but they need to be updated. And of course, uh, new features need to be documented. So there's uh, quite a bit of work there. Um, and I already mentioned the need for a robust process for keeping up Bell resources. And you know, the more data we have uh, there, 
more, the less work it is for people to, to uh, um, adapt the, the system. And that is all I have, except acknowledgements. So uh, the team at Sanofi, Manfred himself, of course, and his team, Nina, Sven, and Martin. Uh, uh, at Clarivate, we have quite a large team uh, with uh, Jefferson and, and Alexander Ishkin, our uh, subject matter expert, although, of course, Natalia is as well. Um, and um, Alexander Rumil and, and Alexi being our developers, uh, and, and they've done a, a wonderful job. And then, of course, uh, everybody, last but not least, William, Natalie, Anthony, and Nick are the um, uh, latest uh, um, team that worked with this at uh, formerly at Silventa and now they are all in different places but uh, still uh, still experts uh, or best experts we have in in Bell. Thank you. Okay. Uh, any quick questions? So who is developing the 2.0 platform? Um, so it got to, um, well, since I am sharing my screen, I will just very briefly pull up um, a couple of other things that I have here. So this is a document that um, is, so this is the roadmap that Silventa produced when they started developing the platform, 2.0 platform. And what we did is I, I sat down with their team and we looked at that document and we color coded it. Now, I think everybody agrees that this document needs to be updated. The roadmap needs to be, the document maybe not, but the roadmap needs to be updated. But there's just a quick uh, to eyeball it. Everything in green has been done. So you can see, for example, that most of the language features are fine and, and golden. Everything in red hasn't been done, and most of the red here in the end is documentation. And then the yellow bits are bits that are partially done. And you say, well, what does that mean? So I have another document for that. Uh, and it's a document that I can share or, and will share with interested parties. So something else that we uh, did um, is to go through uh, GitHub and look at all of the open issues and all of the work streams that are in GitHub under OpenBell. And again, the Sylvanta team started the work and then they took a pause. Um, so this is, again, quite a bit of information. Don't worry terribly about it. I will share this uh, information as well. But the green bit is the new platform. The orangey bit is the data resources such as namespaces and so on. The blue bit uh, on the bottom here is the former framework platform. And then uh, in kind of grayed out bits are things that have been obsoleted and so on. So we went through, uh, we looked at every single one of those modules, we highlighted when it was last updated, what language uh, it uses, um, and so on and so forth. And then over here, we have the issues column, and it shows you how many open issues and errors. Now, not all of them are errors. But you can already very quickly eyeball this and see, for example. So in red, for example, here we have Bell RB. So there are 27 open issues. Not all of them are, you know, extreme, uh, but uh, some of them need to be taken care of before this can be considered done. Uh, next thing that, again, uh, the Sylvanta folks highlighted for me is uh, what they call the Open Bell API, and this is what they use to build the networks under this new platform. Again, we see 35 issues, open issues there. So this kind of is a hot spot there for potential additional development. Uh, and then finally, um, the Bell parser with uh, 15, um, and it's critical. However, there are no major bugs, rather that it's missing some of the functionality, uh, some of the enhancements, and so on and so forth. So this is a way to kind of maybe wrap your mind a little bit around of what's already there, uh, what's not there, and, and so on. So again, this is a document that, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, the working group and, and uh, folks de deciding on the next steps, I think, could use. And it was built with uh, a tremendous amount of help from uh, directly from Sylventa. Uh, 